is my pleasure. My name is Sally Webb. I'm one of the pediatric intensive care unit attending physicians. And it's my pleasure this afternoon to welcome you back from lunch and to introduce our next two speakers. I look forward to an informative discussion. Uh, we'll return to neonatal issues. Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Michael Brady, who is professor and chair in the Department of Pediatrics at Ohio State University. He's physician-in-chief at the Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. He also serves as the chair of the Committee on Infectious Diseases and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Our second speaker I'll introduce now as well is Mr. Steven Savoda. He is the founder and executive director of Attorneys for the Rights of the Child, uh, based in Berkeley, California. He's an attorney with the Carmen Patty Law Group, specializing in patent prosecution and intellectual property protection. He is a tournament level chess player as well, uh, at, the, as, uh, at the rank of expert. Each of the speakers will be given 30 minutes. Uh, there is an error in the program. Each speaker will have 30 minutes to uh, uh, present their topic, and then there will be a 45-minute uh, opportunity for questions from the audience. Good afternoon. Uh, hopefully we can continue with a lot of the discussions we had this, this morning. Uh, I have no financial disclosures. And uh, I'm speaking here today because uh, I was asked by the American Academy of Pediatrics to participate in their task force on circumcision. And the way, the route that I got there was at the time I was on the Committee of Infectious Diseases as well as the Committee on Pediatric AIDS. Uh, and as I will discuss, there was some new information that was felt to be uh, contributory to any decisions around uh, newborn male circumcision uh, related to HIV infection. So this is a highly controversial area. Uh, in general, circumcision in the male refers to the surgical removal of the foreskin or prepus of the penis. Uh, in general, most people would call it a minor surgical procedure, but others have said <coughs> it's child abuse uh, or human rights violation. On the other hand, opponents suggest that it's a biomedical imperative and a very cost-effective preventive strategy. Uh, it's highly unlikely that at the end of this discussion today that people on either side of the issue at the extremes will be actually uh, affected by the discussion. And so when we went about the task force and what our kind of goals were going to be, we wanted to use the evidence rather than emotions uh, to try to help guide us as coming up with a policy. So the American Academy of Pediatrics has looked at this on four different occasions. The first time was in 1975. Uh, and essentially, uh, at that time, they did not feel there was any specific kind of medical indication for male newborn circumcision. In other words, there was no specific medical problem occurring in the infant at the present time that resulted in a requirement for circumcision. Uh, they did acknowledge there was potential health benefits, uh, but many of them they felt needed further study. Uh, and they had evidence of some areas where it was contraindicated, like premature infants or babies that were sick or bleeding disorders. And that was a two-page document. 1989 went up to three pages. Uh, and since that report, there actually were some additional information on some of the health benefits. Uh, they mentioned that it was a relatively rapid and safe procedure. And the complication rates were in the, a low range between 0.2 and 0.6% and were primarily minor. They were local infection and bleeding. Uh, and they said whenever you consider circumcision, uh, the benefits are issued, we explain to parents and informed consent should be obtained. 1999, they came out with a document that now is up to eight pages, uh, and did acknowledge that there was some potential medical health benefits. And that word potential created some issues that I'll talk about in a second. And that these data are not sufficient at that time to recommend Need a, uh, routine neonatal circumcision. Uh, and they also suggested that in areas where there's potential health benefits and risks, if the procedure is not essential to the child's current well-being, parents should determine what is in the best interest of their child. So they acknowledged that there was some potential health benefits, there were some risks, 
and that it was reasonable to allow parents to get information and to make a decision. Now the term potential uh, was then used by a number of states uh, and what happened was, well I'll come back, uh, was by states to defund or discontinue reimbursement for Medicaid recipients for circumcision. And because of that, there was some concerns that because many of the children who potentially have some of the risks that I was going to talk about, uh, or the uh, adverse events associated with uh, not being circumcised, would be highly represented in the Medicaid population. And for that reason, did not feel that it was appropriate that financing should be something that would impact the parent's ability to do what they felt was in the best interest of their child. In addition, there was some significant new information related to the beneficial effects of circumcision on reduction of acquisition of many sexually transmitted infections and HIV, as well as the reduction in penile cancer and cervical cancer. So we've got together a task force, and it was done in a very systematic, objective way. Uh, the American Guide of Pediatrics has a very prescriptive way the way they developed their task force. Uh, it was very comprehensive, transparent, and I will mention about the document, but in it, it specifically goes through all the ways that all the articles were chosen, uh, what kind of evidence was required, and how we did the process. Uh, and the members recruited based on expertise and not on ideology. So as I mentioned, I was chosen because of my background in uh, infectious diseases with special interest in HIV. But we had people who were general pediatricians, we had people who were family practitioners, obstetricians, uh, neonatologists, uh, urologists, uh, we had people in, with anesthesia backgrounds, and bioethicists. So, first thing you need to know is the document that we were put out had 32 pages, so we were quite a few more pages than uh, was in the previous documents, and that was based on the fact that I think that the literature review and the findings required that type of, of an analysis. And the first thing you need to understand is the policy statement does not recommend routine newborn circumcision. That has been one of the uh, significant gripes that we've had is that we were recommending routine circumcision, which we didn't. And the policy statement does not recommend circumcision of any male infant. So the first thing you need to understand is what the document does or doesn't state. And again, I mentioned about the literature review. It was very, very uh, also based on what we felt was high evidence. And we've been criticized that since we didn't include anecdotal cases, opinion pieces, et cetera, that those were things that might reduce the value of the report. But if anybody has kind of looked at medical evidence lately, you'll see that they are very, very low grade. Uh, information and very frequently have been responsible for traditional activities that have not been uh, valuable in the long run. So here's some recommendations on this page. I think most people would say these shouldn't be controversial. Parents should be given instructions on the care of the penis whether the child is circumcised or uncircumcised. Parents are entitled to factually correct non-biased information about circumcision. Physicians counseling families and families about elective male and newborn circumcision should provide non-biased information about the risks and benefits. Elective circumcision should only be performed if the infant's condition is stable. Male circumcision should only be performed by trained and competent practitioners using sterile technique and effective pain management. So in general, that those things should be, I hope, not controversial. The ones that were considered controversial was were the following. Evaluation of current evidence indicates that health benefits of newborn male circumcision outweighs the risks, and the benefits of newborn male circumcision justify access to this procedure for those families who choose it. I'm going to discuss health benefits and risks in just a little bit. Parents should weigh the health benefits and risks in light of their own religious, cultural, and personal preferences, as medical benefits alone may not outweigh those other considerations for individual families. And we do know there are certain religions that actually uh, have as part of their tradition circumcision. Uh, but we also know there are certain groups that believe that circumcision is not appropriate. And we felt that, that those things should be allowed to be included along with health benefits, risks, in the parents making a choice. And we also felt that preventive and, preventive and public health benefits warranted third-party reimbursement for newborn circumcision. 
So, health benefits greater than risk. Now, our task force put that in there, but actually in 2009, the CDC had actually come to the same conclusion, and they were the first ones to actually kind of quantify that, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, and I'm glad that today it's been brought up a number of times that parents do actually have the ethical right to make long-term health decisions for their children. Now, as I mentioned, the CDC, or it's 2007, medical benefits outweigh the risk for infant male circumcision, and there are many practical advantages of doing it in the newborn period. So I'm going to discuss again, one of the criticisms is why not wait until the child is 18? Okay, so health benefits. There are clear evidence of reduction in urinary tract infections, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Acquisition of sexually transmitted infections, including HIV by heterosexual males, HPV, herpes simplex, and syphilis. Now, in, in, uh, these are things that we feel are very, very clear and irrefutable. Uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, there actually was evidence for reduced acquisition of HIV by men who have sex with men. Subsequent studies failed to, to uh, kind of support that, and people believe it had something to do with the impact of antiretroviral therapy. But there was at least previously some evidence for that as well. Another uh, criticism is the fact that we did not include chlamydia and gonorrhea, and the CDC has suggested that they uh, may also be reduced. And when we reviewed the studies, we did find some evidence in some studies that chlamydia and gonorrhea were less common, but it includes those areas where we felt it was very clear. Uh, penile cancer, uh, and just to give you a, a recent study that just came out last week that suggested that with reduction in circumcision rates in Great Britain, they've actually now started to see increases in penile cancer in uncircumcised men. Uh, phimosis, paraphimosis, and balanitis, which are kind of uh, anatomically related. Uh, High-risk HPV acquisition, as well as cervical cancer in female partners. Actual vaginosis in female partners, and lichen sclerosis, sclerosis. And these are very, very clearly identified and irrefutable benefits of circumcision. Now, urinary tract infections. In general, most of the benefit occurs in males in the first year of life you can see a nearly tenfold increased risk of urinary tract infections in males who are not circumcised. But it doesn't just occur in that age group, it actually occurs for the rest of your life. Uh, and when you go to one to 16, it's uh, about a six and a half times increased risk. And then after age 16, it's 3.4%. And now actually what's happening in, particularly in like nursing homes, as you have elderly males who are not circumcised, they are having problems with, uh, I mean, phimosis is a normal process with not, circ being circ not circumcised, but it is resulting in increasing urinary tract infections in that age group. Also, it decreases positive urine cultures and urinary tract infections in infants with vesicular reflux. Um, so, reduced UTIs result in reduced episodes of fever requiring evaluation and instrumentation. Uh, reduced hospitalization and exposure to antibiotics, as well as reduced risk for renal scarring. So reducing urinary tract infections, while it may not sound like a big deal, particularly in the first few years of life, it is a big deal. The effects of circumcision on acquisition of HIV by heterosexual males. Now, there were three randomized controlled studies where they took sexually active males in countries with high prevalence of HIV and they circumcised half, and they didn't circumcise the other fact, half. And we're talking about thousands of individuals in each arm in each country. And what they found was in South Africa, there was a 60% reduction in acquisition by circumcised males. And these studies were all for 24 hours, uh, 24 months or longer. Uh, in Kenya, it was 53%, and in Uganda, it was 51%. And in the study in, in uh, Kenya, they actually have follow-up data up now to 72 months, and the benefit was maintained beyond the study period, and you can see that the rate increased from 53% to 58%, and that's because as more and more of the uncircumcised males got infected, they changed the actual protection rate. 
So it appears that it's not only maintained, but also may provide even a greater benefit long term. Now, these studies have been criticized is the evidence is weak. The evidence is not weak. If you look at evidence gradient, the number one thing is randomized controlled trials. These were three separate randomized controlled trials with thousands of patients. Okay? This is about as good as it gets with evidence uh, because one randomized controlled trial would be good. Three, with this many numbers, with such close uh, outcomes, the evidence is not weak. The other criticism was that it's not appropriate to use an African population because in Africa the higher prevalence of HIV and the primary transmission mode is heterosexual to extrapolate benefit to the United States or any industrialized nation. Well, prior to the three randomized controlled trials, there actually was ample evidence from epidemiologic studies of reduced risk of acquisition of HIV in heterosexual males from industrialized nations as well as from non-industrialized nations. In addition, these three randomized control trials provided what we would call a proof of concept. In other words, we were seeing in epidemiologic studies that there was a reduction of risk in circumcised males, and this said, okay, we took out all the other confounding variables and only had one variable, which was circumcised, not circumcised, and we found out, yes, it was associated with reduction. Now, CDC decided they were going to use the prevalence of HIV in the United States, looked at different race and ethnicity issues, and in heterosexual males only, despite evidence of a small reduction of acquisition of HIV in men or sex with men, and they used USC, US specific data, and what they found was there was a 15.7% reduction in lifetime risk for all males in the United States for acquisition, 7.9% uh, uh, reduction in white males, a 20% or 21% reduction for African male, males, and 12% reduction in Hispanics. And they were looking at it from a cost effectiveness standpoint, it was actually cost saving. So we frequently talk about cost effective, this was cost saving. So doing all of these circumcisions cost less money for all males, for African American males and Hispanics, than was cost effective for white males. So, this particular study did not take into account when it looked at cost, cost of transmission to partners. So in other words, if somebody else got infected, it didn't take that into account, or the other conditions that I mentioned. So there have been some other modeling studies that have actually looked at this. And if in the United States, the circumcision rate, which is about in the high 50% right now, was reduced to levels seen in Western Europe, which is frequently bandied as what we should be doing, that each year for every birth cohort there would be an addition of $500 million for health care costs. In addition, in the state of South Carolina, they looked at the impact of defunding elective newborn male circumcision and that for every year that's been defunded, they projected 100 additional HIV cases with an additional $30 million in net medical costs. Now, like any medical situation, there are going to be some risks and complications. Acutely, it's bleeding, infection, and potentially penile injury. Now, bleeding uh, occurs in uh, about a half percent, or uh, yeah, about a half percent, or about, about 0.2 to 0.5%. Uh, infection is about the same. With bleeding, 60% uh, of the time, it can be uh, controlled just by pressure, and 40% of the time, it requires a stitch. If it happens to be in a child who has a bleeding diathesis, it sometimes requires factor replacement. Infection, the vast majority of them can be cured just by topical therapy. Every once in a while, it does require hospitalization with antibiotics, but that's rare. Penile injury, uh, most of the time, it's uh, either removing too much or too little foreskin, uh, but periodically, the gland is damaged. Late are some adhesions, neatal stenosis, and unsatisfactory cosmetic effect as a result of incomplete circumcision. Now, rate of complications in the U.S. and U.K., and this is multiple studies, have looked at this, come up with about the same, about 1 in 500. Bleeding, uh, as I mentioned, it's about 0.2% would be the higher majority required to re respond to compression. Infection uh, and penile injury, which is 0.02 to 0.04%, uh, and it's more common in individuals who already have anatomical an uh, abnormalities of their urinary tract, uh, and these may actually 
uh, be situations where circumcision may not be indicated until the child is older. Uh, so, now, the other thing that happens is this is a large study in hospitals where they had about 130 some thousand uh, infants who were either circumcised or not circumcised, and they looked at the complications. And again, local infections and hemorrhage I mentioned, uh, urinary tract infections you can see were 10 times more common. But one of the other things that frequently happens is every once in a while a child would be circumcised, and then there'll be an outcome that's bad. And then they, because of the temporal relationship, will blame it. But you can see here things like renal failure, death, meningitis. I'm not going to suggest what happened because the child wasn't circumcised. What I'm suggesting is that whenever you do something very frequently, that you're going to find temporal associations uh, that may not necessarily be causal. And that has become a real kind of issue uh, as we're trying to understand uh, the complications, and particularly when some serious complications have been blamed on circumcision. So the risks of newborn male circumcision are higher when performed outside of an accredited medical facility inadequately trained practitioners, without sterile technique, an infant is not medic uh, medically stable, on a premature infant, or performed on an infant with or without a family history of bleeding diathesis. And in our policy statement, we suggest not doing them under those circumstances. Now, sexual satisfaction, sensitivity, and sexual function. This has been one of the areas that has constantly come up. When you looked at the, the literature on this, the vast majority of studies are very poor, and they're usually poor because of poor study design or because the, uh, they're usually surveys and the studies are frequently biased by individuals who want to have one outcome or another. But if you look at these in general, you can get results that suggest improved sexual satisfaction and sensitivity, diminished sexual satisfaction and sensitivity, or no change. Well. Again, going back to randomized controlled trials as being kind of like the gold standard, there are actually two of them from the African study where they asked these individuals, you know, after they were circumcised. So these were men who were sexually active while they were not circumcised and then after they're circumcised. And the circumcised men experienced less pain on intercourse. They had a slight increase in sexual satisfaction after circumcision, went from 98% to 99.9%. Uh, 64% of circumcised men reported greater penile sensitivity post-circumcision. 55% of the circumcised men had an easier time reaching orgasm than pre-circumcision. And 97% of sexual partners of men who were circumcised reported no change or improved satisfaction with the partner circumcised. Now, I can't think of a better way to assess the impact of circumcision on these sexual health than to have people who actually knew most of the surveys, most of the discussions are from people who either circumcised and then ask later or not circumcised and ask. And this, I think, is, again, the gold standard. Uh, there was a study done in Australia where they just called up set, uh, randomly 7,290 uh, men from a survey of 16 to 64 years of age, and 58% have been circumcised. That means that 42% uh, uh, were not. Uh, in Australia, they've had a re reduction in the number of circumcisions, so it was lower in men over 30 years of age uh, than in older men. And their outcome, uh, or the results from the study, showed that circumcision was unrelated to any of the sexual health difficulties. They did say that uh, circumcised men were somewhat less likely to have worried uh, during sex whether their bodies looked unattractive. And again, one of the complaints about circumcision is that it's disfiguring. And it appears that that's not necessarily the feelings of those people. So, in general, uh, if you look at this, there, there's very little evidence to suggest that circumcision has an adverse effect on sexual satisfaction. Okay, one more criticism is that the AAP policy did not specifically bring up the fact that the foreskin is a highly innervated uh, erogenous piece of tissue. And we didn't ignore that fact. We knew that. We kind of acknowledged that at the beginning. Uh, the situation that we were looking for is, does removal of that piece of tissue actually affect function? And we, our, our feeling was, no. We have a lot of evidence that it didn't affect anything. Now, this highly innervated erogenous tissue also is highly filled with dendritic, dendritic cells, which are the exact cells 
that are attaching to HIV, herpes simplex, uh, uh, treponema pallidum, uh, HPV. And so removing those, uh, yes, you remove some tissue, but it appears that the remaining tissue that's there accommodates for uh, the function, but you're now removing tissue that particularly when the foreskin goes back over top of the uh, penis, traps in organisms that can attach these genetic cells. So we felt that we did not uh, ignore it, we recognized it, but didn't feel that it was relevant. Okay, now, some people have compared circumcision to female genital cutting. It's inappropriate. There's no health benefit for female genital cutting. Complication rate is much higher. And the impact on sexual health, evidence says none for male circumcision. One of the goals of female genital cutting is actually to do that. So these are not the same thing. These are two entirely different situations. Okay, why is it preferable at newborns rather than older age? Well, first of all, complication and uh, rates and costs are much, much higher after the newborn period. Uh, you get the greatest risk for reduction in urinary tract infections and kidney, kidney damage in infancy. And most of the STIs are acquired prior to age 18 years. So you've kind of closed the uh, barn door after the horse has gone out. 47% of U.S. Grade, uh, 12th grade students have had sexual intercourse, and 24% have already had four partners. So if you want to prevent uh, STI transmission and the, get the benefit, you need to do it prior to age 18. Also, the greatest risk for phimosis, paraphimosis, and balanitis occurs in childhood and early adolescence. Now, if you move the deferral of circumcision to age 18, you do allow that individual to make the own, the own decision. However, if the health benefits, including lower complications were, rates, were not lost by deferring to a later age, it would be easy if you defer it up to age 18. However, we're now saying parents have the right to make the decision that's in the best interest of their child, and if they believe that those things are of value, then you don't defer to age 18. So, let me just go to this, but ethics search. So, most of us would agree that parents have the right to conceive and raise their children. Legally and ethically, parents have the right and responsibility to make decisions that are in the best interest of their child. Best interest is informed by parents' experience, culture, and evidence. And in the United States, legal authorities have the right to prohibit take custody of parents from harming their children through acts of commission or omission. So, uh, this is one of Doug's statements, but parents are given great freedom in making decisions for their children, and interference those decisions just the child at significant risk of serious harm. Parents are allowed to raise their children as they see fit, as long as their decisions, rituals, or practices are not, all things considered, likely to be seriously harmful to their children. So, there is strong evidence to support that the health benefits are greater than the risk. Some cultures religious support or do not support newborn male circumcision. Unbiased, objective evidence of health benefits and risk is optimal means to inform parents about best interest, and parents can ethically make decisions that do not cause harm and which are in the best interest of their children. So, parental views on circumcision. One of the most common reasons why parents have their child circumcised is they want their son to look like their father. Now, you would have to say that if circumcision was causing all these trouble, why would so many people want them, want whatever bad outcome they have to be given to their son? It's unlikely that that's the case. So in general, I think that that kind of lends itself to the fact that most people don't uh, feel that this is a significant health concern. Parents are interested in receiving unbiased information about male circumcision. And in a study of boys from 6 to 36 months of age from two different practice sites, parents whose child was not, were not circumcised, they were more likely to believe that they weren't given good information about making the decision. They had not been asked whether they wanted to have their child circumcised. And the majority of them actually were reconsidering the decision now that they had the information. So I'll be down one second again. So to finalize, would it be ethical to withhold evidence from parents relating to health benefits and risks? Would it be ethical to prohibit parents from making a decision that they believe is in the best interest of their child if evidence supports that health benefits outweigh the risk? Would it be ethical to deny access to preventive health measures based on source of health care payment? And the last thing is, 
whether it's legal. Well, currently, there's no jurisdiction in the United States has any law prohibiting male newborn circumcisions. So therefore, it's legal. And since there are a number of religions uh, who support this as part of their traditions, given our kind of separation of church and state, I think it's going to be very, very difficult uh, for us to actually consider that. And in Denmark, which isn't quite as much about the separation of church and state, they just recently overturned their ban on circumcision uh, based on, on that as well. So it is currently legal, uh, and I don't think it's going to become illegal. San Francisco tried to have a ban, and that was uh, turned over. So I would like to thank you, and I'll be back up later. Thank you.